Hayek and London had heard reports about it. Some reacted with hysteria, especially after Mises published his position as Die Krise und der Kapitalismus, Crisis and Capitalism. His former student, Hedwig Lemberger, claimed that economic science was bankrupt if it had no other solution for unemployment than to allow the unhampered market to reduce wage rates. She argued that Mises' Manchester liberal analysis applied only to the conditions of the 19th century, while in the present crisis unemployment resulted from unmanageably fast technological progress, as Emil Lederer had explained. Mises replied, I cannot understand why it is a declaration of bankruptcy for economic science to see one of the causes of disruptions of economic life in the labor union policy of keeping wage rates above the level that would be established on the unhampered market, and in the fact that government supports this policy through unemployment relief and the refusal to protect job seekers. Streamlining has nothing to do with unemployment. There was streamlining also in the 19th century, maybe even to a relatively greater extent than today, but because at the time there were no interventions in the formation of wage rates, the fired workers found employment in new and extended industries. They would even have been absorbed far quicker, but for a number of government regulations that hampered their freedom of migration and change of profession. My assumptions do not merely rely, as you believe, on the experience of times long past, but especially on irrefutable theoretical considerations. Eventually the crisis was settled the same way as the post-war crisis ten years earlier, more foreign debt. In July 1932, Austria secured a foreign credit of 300 million shillings from the League of Nations. The road was free for a new beginning. The crisis prompted a renewed interest in business cycle research and in seeking the means for government to steer the economy away from the increasingly dramatic swings between boom and bust. The Vienna Institute for Business Cycle Research published two monographs that were to become classics in the literature of economic science, Hayek's Preise und Produktion and Fritz Machlup's Börsenkredit, Industriekredit und Kapitalbildung. Mises was very proud of these works, especially of Machlup's book, which he called a masterpiece. Austrian analysis of the fundamental practical issues of the day were much needed to counter prevailing anti-capitalist views. Mises' educational mission over the past ten years now paid off. Many years later, a member of the Mises orbit recalled in correspondence the diehard Kempferische group of Mises, Hayek, Striegel, Morgenstern, and minor that used all available media and institutions to plead the case for economic liberty and against government interventionism. These activities had their impact on public policy, in distinct contrast to the massive proto-Keynesian deficit spending policies that in the early 1930s came to be applied in other Western countries. The Austrian government pursued a program of comparative austerity with some very positive results. From 1932 to 1937, national production dramatically increased in industry and agriculture. The government's budget was balanced. Foreign public debt was cut in half. Central bank reserves doubled, and unemployment shrank from 310,000 to 222,000. One ally of this group, Fritz Wolfram, proposed a radical remedy to the situation, total liberalization of the monetary sector. Wolfram not only recommended rescinding foreign exchange controls, he also called for the abolition of all impediments to private minting and the private issue of banknotes. This reform, he argued, would not only be a way out of the present calamity and prevent similar crises in the future, it would also lead to monetary liberalization in other countries. This, in turn, would raise the price of precious metals, further rewarding the early adopters. It is certain that the country that first liberates the monetary economy will benefit most from its fructifying benefits, and it is obvious that once the process is set in motion, each country must follow the others. As Wolfram's case demonstrates, the crisis divided the wheat from the chaff within the classical liberal movement. Some abandoned liberalism and returned to interventionism, while others became more radical in their defense of liberty. Lionel Robbins wrote to Mises, Every day reveals fresh incursions of the system of free exchange and private property, and it becomes clear that the number of persons capable of putting up an intelligent defense of capitalist institutions is very small. Behind the scenes, we do what we can, but there are not many of us to carry on the battle. 
The sad thing about the crisis is that it seems to be driving so many who at one time were good liberals over to the other side. With me, it has been just the opposite. All sorts of doubts and mental reservations have been cleared up, and I am conscious of being much more streng than in the past. Certainly, to judge from the quality of the argument on the other side, it ought not to be difficult to defeat it on that plane. Streng means severe. Mises agreed. At the end of December, he wrote a two-part article for the Neue Freie Presse on the gold standard and its enemies. He argued it was impossible to replace gold in international exchanges and even in domestic exchanges. The position of this metal would only grow stronger the more the national governments followed their inflationary policies. Mises accepted a proposal of the journalist Robert Scheu, who in February 1932 had invited him to take part in what was then an entirely new format, the talk show. Shory's idea was to conduct live interviews with prominent experts on the pressing economic issues of the day. The interviews would be held in a public auditorium and broadcast to a radio audience. The first interviewee in early March 1932 was Ottmar Spann. The evening was apparently a great success, despite the fact that Spann had rarely given public lectures. Still, Mises hesitated. From previous correspondence, Mises knew Shoy to be a money crank, so he sought to establish a list of questions to which he would reply. Mises eventually appeared on the talk show on Thursday, March 17th, to discuss the gold standard compared to other monetary systems, the regulation of the monetary circulation of a national economy, the role of central banks in monetary policy, the creation of national currencies, and the theories of Silvio Gazel, Germany's most popular money crank who advocated new laws to encourage the spending of money by special tax on hoarding, that is, on savings. Gazel's views found a spokesman in the eloquent and authoritative Keynes. In early April 1932, then, Mises eventually got the comma to adopt a resolution against the artificial exchange rate of the shilling. Albert Hahn wrote from Frankfurt, asking Mises to what extent he was responsible for the contents of the comma report, to which Mises replied, The resolution has resulted from a first draft that I wrote, but after difficult and lengthy negotiations it has been revised to obtain unanimity through compromise. Hence, I myself cannot, of course, take public responsibility. I would have stated things less ambiguously. The Austrian government did not change its course, and by June, a return to the old gold parity was no longer possible without upsetting the price system, which had adjusted to the circumstances. The economic situation had considerably deteriorated, and Mises was furious, fulminating in a letter to his Dutch colleague and friend, G. M. Verein Stewart. In Austria we stand on the debris of the interventionist and state socialist system. All of the public firms have passive balances, and considerable sums of tax money must be used to compensate for these deficits. Unemployment grows and unemployment relief devastates public finance. But the peak of the madness is the foreign exchange controls. He who seeks to study the consequences of thoroughgoing state socialism, city socialism, and interventionism should pursue these studies in Austria, where we enjoy government interventionism without gaps. We have reached the point where those who merely argue in favor of protective tariffs and against the prohibition of imports are decried as free traders. It was probably in these days that Mises became a metalist. Having supported the gold exchange standard, he now advocated a metallic currency as a way to keep government out of monetary policy altogether. Mises here states that he advocated the classical old gold standard and not the gold exchange standard, and that I changed my mind concerning the functioning of the gold exchange standard as it happened more than thirty years ago. More than twenty years earlier in the first edition of his Theory of Money and Credit, he had come close to poking fun at the simpletons who believed coins of precious metal were money in some stronger sense than banknotes were. As a young man, he had come across gold and silver coins only as collector's items. His father had a famous collection. He had always understood the merit of a metallic standard to keep the quantity of money independent of political manipulation, but he had never advocated the actual circulation of gold or silver coins. But now the evidence was undeniable. Governments could not be trusted even with the production of money. He remained a monetary metalist for the rest of his life. In a roundtable discussion on the gold standard that took place in January 1948, Mises spoke only once, and only 
to underline a point made by another speaker. Under present conditions, no return to the gold standard is possible without a return to an effectual circulation of gold coins. If gold coins are employed in daily transactions, if everybody is used to receiving and giving away gold pieces, if people are accustomed to carrying gold coins for retail purposes, the public becomes aware of the fact that gold is the nation's standard money and that the country is under a gold standard. This cognizance is not merely pedagogic value. It enables the average citizen to realize in time whether his government is clinging to sound monetary policies or whether it is tampering with the currency system. The weakness of a gold standard without effectual circulation of gold coins consists precisely in the fact that it makes it extremely difficult for the average citizen to discern inflation in its early stages. An effectual gold coin circulation makes the voter the guardian of the gold standard. This is its main function. He was underlining something said by Spa. Second edition of Socialism The battles on the political front had their impact on Mises' academic pursuits, especially on his teaching. The 1931-1932 private seminar met more irregularly, or at any rate was less well planned than usual. At least some of the sessions apparently dealt with the theory of capital and the business cycle, featuring lectures by Machlup, Morgenstern and Bloch. His university seminar now focused on methodological problems of the social sciences. Subjects dealt with in the winter semester were the relationship between theory and praxis, and between facts and theories, the implications of the is-ought distinction, the universal validity of economic knowledge, quantitative and qualitative knowledge, the relations between statistical, historical and theoretical research, the meaning of verstehen, behaviorism, the mathematical method, forecasting in economics and economics and sociology. Mises had to begin the 1932 summer semester late because he had to attend two conferences of the International Chamber of Commerce and also take part in a World Economic Conference in Berlin, which reunited politicians and experts from all over the world to discuss the implications of the present crisis for international commerce and finance. The ICC conference in Innsbruck took place in the third week of April, the Welthandelswoche in the first week of May, and the ICC conference in Munich started on May 18th. The Weltwirtschaftskonferenz Berlin 1932 was part of a Welthandelswoche, a week-long conference organized by the newspaper Berliner Tageblatt. Mises was back in Vienna by Friday morning, May 6th, for urgent kammer business. The seminar sessions continued the discussion of the winter semester, dealing in particular with behaviorism and its relationship with the approach of German historicism, the meaning of meaning in the social sciences and its connections with utilitarianism, the concept of homo economicus, economics and sociology, sociology and history, and again forecasting in economics. Mises' biggest academic project in 1931-1932 was the preparation of the second edition of Socialism. Upon his return from the United States, he found on his desk a letter from Gustav Fischer announcing that Fischer was running out of copies of Socialism and inquiring whether Mises would be interested in doing a second edition. Of course he would. The first edition comprised 2,000 copies, plus 100 complementary and review copies, more than a thousand of which had been sold within two years of publication, to the point that, in 1924, already Fischer anticipated a second edition for some time after 1925. Eventually, however, the sales did not confirm these hopes. Mises' friend, F.G. Steiner, a Paris-based banker, believed the main reason the book was not more popular was the inadequacy of its German title. The prospect of learning something about Gemeinwirtschaft, the communal economy, did not appeal to less educated readers. He hoped a new edition would soon be forthcoming. Even more so than when your book was first published, there is today a kind of defeatism spreading among members of the capitalist class. Arguments of the type so brilliantly presented in your book could provide the necessary encouragement. Mises began revising the manuscript, probably in the summer of 1931. In order not to increase the length of the book, he had to cut some parts to compensate for additions. Following suggestions by Robbins, for example, he added a comment on the impossibility of syndicalism, and also added a discussion of Heimann's Mehrwert und Gemeinwirtschaft, 1922, as an appendix to the new edition. 
Mises in fact reproduced in his book the entire survey on recent contributions to the analysis of socialist calculation that he had published some years before in the archive. The passages on Heimann stress the dynamic nature of the problem of pricing. Prices for factors of production cannot simply be imputed backwards from the prices for consumers' goods since the entrepreneur produces for future consumption and future prices for consumers' goods cannot be directly inferred from present prices. Mises sent the first 405 pages of the revised manuscript to Fisher at the end of October 1931. Then the process slowed due to Mises's greater involvement in the campaign against foreign exchange controls. In order not to lose too much time, Mises had asked four friends to help him review the proof pages. The division of labor worked well, and on February 26, 1932, Mises sent the last pages to Fisher by courier. Fisher received it the next day and immediately forwarded it to Lippert and Company in Naumburg. A month later, Fisher held the first copies in his hands, and on April 1st, Mises received his complimentary copies in Vienna. He received 30 complimentary copies of the book, 10 of which were hardcover. 20 of these sexual hardcovers were sent to Vienna. Mises had Fisher send the remaining ten plus nine more copies for which he himself paid to the following people. Hardcover copies went to Robbins, Anderson, Sulzbach and Beveridge. Paperbacks went to Gregory, Hayek, both Verein Stewarts, Adolf Weber, Passau, Wieser, Oswald, Fleurus, Halm, Hahn, Röpke, Wolfrum, Butzkus and Lederer. The book was a financial success for Mises. He received a prepaid 15% of the selling price of a total volume of 1,500 copies and with royalties totaling 4,050 marks. But the most gratifying result lay in the reactions from both friends and foes who honoured the new edition as the leading anti-socialist and affirmatively liberal work within scientific economic literature. One reviewer said, the battle between individualism and socialism, which by now has been waged almost 100 years, has now entered its final phase. In a few years or decades, at most, victory will be on one side or the other. At the high point of this battle, Mises's book is a crucial action. It is impossible to estimate its intellectual, economic, and, in the long run, even its political implications. Critics charged that Mises had not taken account of the most recent attempt to solve the problem of socialist calculation, but they made no attempt to name or describe these alleged new solutions. Another typical criticism was to qualify Mises' ideas as utopian. Some critics apparently felt pity for Mises, whose radicalism had left him few allies. One such critic wrote about Mises' tragic fate. He advocates the liberalism of the so-called classical economist so unshakably and bluntly that he has become an embarrassment to those who would normally agree with him. Mises disdains any concessions in matters of social policy and ideology, and hence he provides a cheap opportunity to many liberal theoreticians who are just not as courageous as he is to differentiate themselves from him in a self-serving and compassionate way. Inadvertently, this critic had pointed out a great service that Mises provided for all those who were, like the critic himself, opposed to government omnipotence, but did not want to reduce the scope of the state as radically as did the Vienna economist. Mises put these half-baked liberals in a comfortable middle-of-the-road position. They could make use of his arguments without a full commitment to their practical implications. Mises made them appear less radical. It is true that Mises' radicalism alienated some of those who might otherwise have been closer allies, but it also altered the thinking of many open-minded readers, those who were willing to weigh his arguments against their prejudices. These readers often acknowledged the pertinence of his analysis of socialism and interventionism. Mises' work made them understand that capitalism must not be confused with the observed reality of the traditional economic order. One reviewer said, Possibly the greatest merit of the work is that it shows that the present-day shortcomings of capitalism, the so-called economic system of individualism, result to a large extent from the fact that, for some time now, we have not had such a system, but ever more distort it in the interest of domestic and foreign policy. Another. In some circles, Mises is called the last consistent representative 
of a liberal economic order. He is certainly not the last, but after many years the first, who has dared to think through all the consequences of such an order, and to erect and demonstrate a doctrine with unshakable logic. The most enthusiastic responses came from younger economists. But these followers did not expect Mises' argument to convert the mainstream any time soon. One of them, Georg Halm, from the University of Würzburg, said Mises himself was too optimistic. I could name no work that is as revolutionary within its field as your Gemeinwirtschaft. Later generations will probably recognize this much more clearly than the bulk of your contemporaries. I believe you overestimate the latter considerably in your statements that your views are rarely contested today. Isn't the discussion of your Gemeinwirtschaft in Lederer's brochure Planned Economy mind-boggling? The response, I find that Lederer in his amply unclear brochure Centrally Planned Economy makes it obvious that socialist theory is completely bankrupt. In fact, the use of money is, in his eyes, the only basis for economic calculation, but he fails to see that in a society in which the means of production are not privately owned, there is no pricing process for means of production. Moreover, and characteristically, he falls prey to the other error of Kautsky, in that he wants to use past prices as a starting point. The few pages dedicated to this problem deliver nothing new, and are even more confused than the previous justification attempts by socialist writers. Dresden Meeting of the Verein für Sozialpolitik On January 4th and 5th, 1932, in meetings of the board and of the committee of the Verein für Sozialpolitik in Berlin, Mises met some of these colleagues whom he so overestimated. He had unsuccessfully encouraged Hayek to attend the sessions, saying, Doubtlessly it will be interesting. Maybe it is the last meeting before the abolition of usury. Brechung der Zinsknechtschaft. The phrase abolition of usury alludes to point 11 of the National Socialist Worker Party program of February 24, 1920. Mises hoped to convince the committee to have value theory and the economics of cartels discussed at the forthcoming plenary meeting in Dresden. Both projects were thwarted when the committee, after a heated debate, decided to set the issue of national autarky, economic self-sufficiency through trade isolation, on the agenda. Mises thought this decision was completely unacceptable and that it had the potential to destroy the Verein, there was no common ground for the discussion of autarky. Making it the subject of discussion was bound to intensify rather than alleviate the clashes among members. Disillusioned with the Verein's willingness to promote productive scientific cooperation, he did not even plan to attend the Dresden meeting, but changed his mind when he learned from Spiethoff that there would finally be a subcommittee meeting on value theory. I have not yet entirely abandoned all hope that it will be possible to do fruitful work within the Verein für Sozialpolitik all depends on the course of the Dresden meeting and on the new president, said Mises in a letter to Georg Jan. In preparation for this meeting, Spiethoff and Mises edited a volume on the problems of value theory. Probleme der Wertlehre. The chapters of this book were solicited from proponents and opponents of the Austrian theory of value and prices. The selection of the authors ensured that all major points of view could be expressed. Superficially, the great divide was between the moderns, that is, advocates of marginal value theory as the basis of price theory, and the Cassilian, Compart, historicist, Gottel, Marxist, Oppenheimer, and universalist, Spann, opponents. This divide was also reflected in the co-editorship of Mises and Spiethoff, who were known to be in different camps, but more to the point, the book was part of Mises's strategy to spread the message that economic science was not a matter of mere personal opinion. There are certain fundamental facts on which all past and present economists agreed, despite all the differences separating the various schools. The subcommittee meeting took place immediately after the plenary meeting, which was held on September 28th and 29th, 1932. Mises gave the opening talk, emphasizing that marginal value theory alone was able to explain all economic phenomena, and that the different forms in which the marginal principle was advocated were not nearly as incompatible as the opponents of economic science claim. His speech was subsequently printed with that title in Mises and Arthur Spiethoff editors Probleme der Wertlehre, reprinted with the title Der Streit um die Werttheorie, 
in Mises' book Grundprobleme der Nationalökonomie, translated by George Reisman as The Controversy over the Theory of Value. As one newspaper report put it, the meeting was attended by a large delegation from Vienna and by advocates of the marginal utility school working in foreign countries. These participants showed how productively the theories of the Vienna and the Lausanne schools could be further developed. The discussion was less controversial than might have been expected because the main opponents of value theory, Liefmann, Kassel, Spann and Oppenheimer, had not even come to take part in the meeting. Neither had any of their disciples appeared. This was a remarkable fact in its own right and was duly noticed in the preface of the proceedings. The debate was then to a large extent a Viennese affair. But the Dresden meeting was also a breakthrough from the point of view of contemporary history. It was a high point of the renaissance of political economy in Germany. During the preceding decade, economic theory had again become palatable in the places of higher learning, where the historical school had for a long time reigned supreme. Three publications in 1931 epitomized this change and the central role Mises played in it. The most important of these publications was the third edition of Adolf Weber's textbook, which, in Mises' judgment, was the most significant German-language textbook of economics in its day. Weber had sent Mises a copy of his book in November 1931. Mises replied, I greet the success of your book as a sign that public opinion is beginning a gradual shift in the direction of sound ideas. Similarly, the Frankfurt professor Budke published his textbook on monetary economics, Lehre vom Geld, in which he acknowledged Mises' achievements and critically discussed Mises' views. Mises was very grateful. Some two years later, shortly after Hitler had seized power in Germany, Mises stated that his monetary theory had become in Germany, after the First World War, the dominant theory of the business cycle. Last but not least, Georg Halm published a revised edition of the late Ludwig Pohler's standard textbook on capitalism and socialism, based on Pohler's notes. The great bulk of the extensive editions brought a more radical rejection of socialist schemes, bolstered by quotations from socialism and other of Mises' works. In the same year, a PhD student of Halm's in Würzburg, Karl Wagner, defended a doctoral thesis that ripped National Socialist ideology apart and received praise from Mises. Mises said, Your work needs to be welcomed not only as a scientific achievement, but also as a political deed. Wagner was one of several promising young economists who were eventually swept aside by German National Socialism. The seeds Mises had planted in German soil were in for a long winter. Most of them died during the Nazi episode. Those few that survived experienced a short blossoming in the late 1940s and 1950s and helped re-establish a market economy in the land of Bismarck and Hitler. The 1932 Dresden meeting of the Verein gave a taste of what might have been possible if Mises' campaign to demonstrate the libertarian political implications of economic science had been allowed to run its course. The first day of the meeting featured a session on industrialization and unemployment. Werner Zombart was now a vice-president of the Verein and in charge of selecting the invited lecturers. He had difficulty finding lecturers he considered suitable. Eventually, he opted for his disciple Manuel Zeitzel of Zurich and for Gerhard Kolm of Kiel, but neither one endorsed the Zombartian line which presented the massive unemployment in Germany and Austria as a consequence of economization and streamlining in industry. They argued that such technological changes could not cause unemployment on a massive and permanent scale. Zaitsev contended that the real reasons included high tariffs, and Kolm pointed to the inflexibility of wage rates and other prices, which resulted from powerful labor unions and cartels. Colm also stated that the selection process of the market was hampered by modern bankruptcy laws which were too lenient on debtors and by subsidies paid to unprofitable firms. Clearly, these views were not to the liking of Zombart or the Verein establishment. The next day of the meeting, Thursday, September 29th, 1932, demonstrated even more forcefully how much economic common sense had displaced the old allegiance to the interventionist creed. The sessions were supposed to deal with the question of autarky, but the meeting once again took an entirely different course from what the Verein leadership had anticipated. 
Here, too, Zombart had had difficulties finding suitable candidates who could make a substantial case in favour of autarky. He eventually settled on Konstantin von Dietze and Emil Lederer, who were only moderate autarchists at best. Dietze half-heartedly defended autarky by arguing that food freedom was necessary in war and that agrarian workers were physically better suited as soldiers, but he concluded his talk insisting that autarky offered no solution to unemployment and that his real confidence lay with the forces of the free market. The high point of the meeting approached when Emil Lederer, with the full authority of his position at the University of Berlin, in a brilliant speech that was based on the traditional arguments of the free trade doctrine and on the most recent statistical data, argued that no country was less suited to engage in protectionism than Germany. In the ensuing debate on autarky, almost all the speakers emphasized that it was wrong to oppose free trade as contrary to the national interest, and that it would be wrong to make free trade policies conditional on the trade policies of other countries. Commenting on the meeting for a major Vienna business newspaper, Louise Zommer noticed the historical irony of the Verein's majority now advocating free trade and free markets. Zommer traced the emergence of this new majority to the early 1920s, when Heinrich Herkner's endorsement of Mises' socialism caused a crisis of social policy. Mises' ideas, wrote Zommer, were the primary agent of the transformation of Germany's intellectual landscape in the 1920s. The ideas that Mises developed in his book have affected the entire ideology of the Verein für Sozialpolitik and turned it toward an endorsement of the free market economy. It is from this point on that the Verein has unmistakably changed its goals. It has now become a battlefield for the debate of questions of economic principle and economic order. It is a milestone of the history of this association, that free market ideas have had a renaissance at this year's meeting that the fight against autarky, against the whole system of restraints and regulations that fetters economic life, has been taken up at the meeting with much energy. Just as Mises was finally beginning to stir the spirit of liberty among the young generation of German economists, the old Katheder Sozialisten had a final and devastating triumph. On January 30th, 1933, their intellectual scion, Adolf Hitler, was appointed Chancellor of the German Reich. When the Nazis rose to power, they immediately began with their program of Gleichschaltung, enforced conformity, literally synchronization, whose goal was to subordinate all organizations to the central Nazi organizations that controlled the federal government. Faced with the choice of becoming part of the Nazi apparatus or self-dissolution, the Verein honorably chose to disband in December of 1936. Even more honorably, Mises quit the Verein three years earlier in immediate protest against the Gleichschaltung laws. The Verein was re-established after the Second World War in 1948. Mises did not wish to have anything to do with this post-war organization. Mises was also one of the initiators of an international effort to provide new career opportunities to the academics whom the Nazis expelled from Germany. At the end of March 1933, Beveridge and Robbins were in Vienna and met Mises for dinner. Their Austrian friend stormed into the lobby of the Hotel Bristol, breaking the news that the Nazis had fired a number of Jewish academics, such as Bonn, Mannheim and Kantorwitz. On the spot, the three men discussed what could be done to help these German socialists. Would it be possible to set up relief funds in France and Britain to employ them? Beveridge announced that he himself would oversee a relief action to LSE. Back in London, Robbins organized a meeting of LSE's professorial council, which voted for a scheme of voluntary deductions from staff salaries to finance the relief fund. He also convinced Beveridge to support an even larger scheme, and eventually a relief fund was created on a national scale. In a letter to Mises in which he reported on progress, Robbins praised his correspondent for having seen the practical implications of the new situation and for initiating an effective response. Economic Theory Completed In the Dresden discussions of value theory, Mises had emphasized that a productive debate could take place only among those who did not rule out the possibility of a universally valid social theory. 
Those who excluded this possibility on an a priori grounds were forced to endorse what Mises would eventually call polylogism, the extreme historicist hypothesis that there is no such thing as a generally valid social theory because the structure of the human mind was in a state of constant flux. According to this hypothesis, there is not just one universally valid theory of human action, there are in fact several different logics of action. The most explicit champion of polylogism had been the socialist Josef Dietzgen, 1828-1888, who had developed a materialistic philosophy independent of Marx and Engels. In 1929, the case for polylogism came into the spotlight of scientific debate with the publication of Karl Mannheim's Ideologie und Utopie. It quickly found support in all political camps. Polylogism was an expedient tool to avoid the scrutiny of arguments, especially those made by economists, and to replace the sober process of reasoning with the emotional appeal of name-calling. Advocates of polylogism could simply declare all theories they disliked as bourgeois theories, without entering into a detailed discussion of their contents and arguments. Not surprisingly, the German racists were eager to adopt the same comfortable strategy to avoid critical debate of the ideology of the Aryan master race. Mises recalled, Professor Biberbach of the University of Breslau distinguishes between Anglo-Saxon Franco-Jewish mathematics and German mathematics. Professor Lennart, the winner of the Nobel Prize, believes that only German physics are true, whereas the physics of all the other nations are simply nonsense. The author was a medical doctor. A few years later, Mises explained the historical setting of this intellectual current. Until the middle of the 19th century, everybody took it for granted that the logical structure of the human mind is the same with every human being. All human relations are based on this assumption. Wherever men met men, they never had any doubt in this respect. All philosophers and all laymen agreed were unanimous in this belief. But in the middle of the 19th century, Karl Marx expanded a different view. According to Marx, the logical structure of mind is different with the members of different classes. The human mind does not find truth but ideologies. Ideologies seem true in the eyes of the members of the same class, but are meaningless in the eyes of members of other classes. Every class produces its own ideologies, which later are debunked by ideologies of other classes. In this way, Karl Marx stigmatized the philosophy of John Locke as a bourgeois philosophy. Later Marxians called Schopenhauer the philosopher of the rentier class and Nietzsche the philosopher of big business. Lenin, the founder of the Third International, and Frederick Adler, the secretary general of the Second International, investigated whether the physical theories of Mach are bourgeois or not. The Einstein theory of relativity is branded by some Bolsheviks as bourgeois and reactionary. In this lecture, Mises presented material that he eventually published in Omnipotent Government. In the 1932 debate in Dresden, Mises pointed out that any defense of the polylogistic hypothesis involves a self-contradiction, since the exchange of arguments only makes sense if the logical structure of the human mind is independent of social or racial class. A Marxist, and I understand by this term not only the members of a political party that swears by Marx, but all who appeal to Marx in their thinking concerning the sciences of human action, who condescends to discuss a scientific problem with people who are not comrades of his own class, has given up the first and most important principle of his theory. If thought is conditioned by the thinker's social existence, how can he understand me, and how can I understand him? If there is a bourgeois logic and a proletarian logic, how am I, the bourgeois, to come to an understanding with him, the proletarian? Whoever takes the Marxist point of view seriously must advocate a complete division between bourgeois and proletarian science. And the same is also true, mutatis mutandis, of the view of those who regard thought as determined by the race or the nationality of the thinker. The Marxists cannot be satisfied with separating classes in athletic contests with a bourgeois and a proletarian Olympics. He must demand this separation above all in scientific discussion. The fruitlessness of many of the debates that were conducted here in the Verein für Sozialpolitik, as well as in the Gesellschaft für Soziologie, are to be attributed more than anything else to the neglect of this principle. In my opinion, the position of dogmatic Marxism is wrong, but that of the Marxist who engages in discussions with representatives of what he calls bourgeois science is confused. 
The consistent Marxist does not seek to refute opponents whom he calls bourgeois. He seeks to destroy them physically and morally. He had only touched on this point, which he now regarded as fundamental, in a paper he wrote for Probleme der Wertlehre, the volume that served as a basis for the discussion in Dresden. In a paper he had written in preparation for the Dresden meeting, Mises had highlighted the wider significance of polylogism, characterizing it as a romantic revolt against logic and science, and pointing out that it does not limit itself to the sphere of social phenomena and the sciences of human action, it is a revolt against our entire culture and civilization. In Dresden, Emil Edra argued that this argument was considerably overblown. Mises was wrong in assuming that the being generates consciousness theory implied that every single instance of thought is ideology, in the Marxist sense of an intellectualization of economic interests. According to Lederer, nobody claimed that there were no universally valid theories. Logic and mathematics certainly counted, but neither could it be denied that there were other disciplines, the basic categories of which were largely dependent on the historical situation, that is, on the social structure of the time, and on the social position of the thinker. Leder went on. Now the question is whether economics belongs to the first category of sciences, which totally rely on pure intuition, reine Anschauung, and logic, or to the socially determined fields of knowledge in the sense of modern sociology, or, if you wish, in the sense of Marxism. Herr von Mises apparently shares the view of the physiocrats, the latter believed that the physiocratic theory was as obliging for each rational thinker as the theorem of Pythagoras. Herr von Mises apparently claims the same rank, the same validity for economic theory in its entire scope, and this is what I deny. It is true that economic theory has a kernel that is independent of historical economic developments, but this general or exact or pure theory for which I feel affinities is not the theory of economic action per se in all its historical phases. The substance of this theory is a narrow one. It essentially covers the static process or stationary circulation Kreislauf. It ultimately deduces all consequences from the principle of economizing, as applied to man in his dependency on nature. In his rejoinder, Mises pointed out that static economic theory did not merely apply to static processes, but especially to change. The word static did not mean that the subject of inquiry was a stationary economy. Rather, it referred to a specific method of analysis which studied the implications of a change of one datum, ceteris paribus, that is, under the assumption that all other data remained unchanged. But Mises still had not clarified his views about the epistemological character of economic science. This was the task to which he proceeded upon his return to Vienna, where he finished an essay on the task and scope of the science of human action. Mises planned to publish this piece as the introductory chapter of a new book on fundamental problems of economic analysis. The book would contain various essays he had published in the past five years in the fields of epistemology and value theory. The idea was to clarify the very foundations of economic science, not only by a general discussion of its philosophical character, but also by restating the core concepts of value and capital theory. The book would therefore contain both an introduction to economics from the point of view of the philosophy of science and actual economic analyses of value and of inconvertible capital. The first three chapters on epistemology consumed some 60% of the volume. The next four chapters dealt with value theory and the concluding essay was his contribution to the Verein Stuart Festschrift. Mises finished revising the manuscript over Christmas 1932 and on January 3, 1933, wrote to Gustav Fischer to propose the book for publication. Fischer did not believe the book would sell well, but agreed to publish it. By mid-April, Mises received the first copies of Grund, Probleme der Nationalökonomie, Fundamental Problems of Economics. Almost three decades later, Mises' American student, George Eisman, produced a translation. The American edition eventually appeared under the somewhat different title of Epistemological Problems of Economics. His new essay on the task and scope of the science of human action was chapter one. It would be the keystone of the system of economics Mises had been working on for years. 
Taking up Lederer's challenge, Mises argued that economic laws were true a priori on a par with the laws of logic and mathematics. To the present day, this has remained one of his most controversial tenets, but the debate resulted, in most cases, from a misunderstanding of his position. Twentieth-century social scientists typically argued that science was always based on experience, and that any proposition that was based instead on some arbitrary a priori principle was therefore not scientific. Mises agreed. He had been a proponent of a rigid fact orientation since his early years as a student. He had enthusiastically supported Max Weber in the controversy on value judgments, arguing. That the proper sphere of science was the world as it is, not as it should be. Mises himself rigorously held to the notion that true science was always concerned with verifiable facts. So why were his epistemological views controversial? Most other social theorists believed that the facts relevant for the social sciences could be known through observation-based methods of inquiry. Here, Mises disagreed. In the tradition of Karl Menger's quest for empirical theory, he believed that economic theory describes facts of the real world, such as the one that human beings make choices. Thus, he insisted, for the purposes of science, we must start from the action of the individual, because this is the only thing of which we can have direct cognition. And he also stated, science cannot proceed otherwise than discursively. Its starting points must have as much certainty as human knowledge is capable of, and it must go on from there, making logical deductions step by step. It can begin as an a prioristic science with propositions necessary to thought that find their support and warrant in apodictic evidence, or as an empirical science it can start with experience. But facts of this sort cannot be observed. It is impossible, for example, to look at choices, to smell them or touch them. Economics is not an empirical science in this sense, but it is a science nevertheless because the facts it deals with are true, even though they are unavailable to the human sensory apparatus. The proper method to analyze them is through discursive reasoning. Mises stressed again his conviction that economics is part of a more general social theory, and now he gave more precision to what this theory was all about. It was a theory of human action. The science of human action that strives for universally valid knowledge is the theoretical system, whose hitherto best elaborated branch is economics. In all of its branches, this science is a priori, not empirical. Like logic and mathematics, it is not derived from experience; it is prior to experience. It is, as it were, the logic of action and deed. He went on to argue that the theory of human action ultimately coincides with the science of logic. Human thought serves human life and action. It is not absolute thought, but the forethought directed toward projected acts, and the afterthought that reflects upon acts done. Hence, in the last analysis, logic and the universally valid science of human action are one and the same. How did Mises address Lederer's argument that only a part of economic theory was universally valid, namely, the aspect that dealt with the equilibrium relationship between human action and nature? Mises argued that universal validity does not imply that all laws of human action apply in every single instance of human behavior. Rather, it means that a law applies whenever the conditions specified by it are given. Whether or not they are is an empirical question, but once this is stipulated, the law holds true on a priori grounds. For example, we are unable to grasp the concept of economic action and of economy without implying in our thought the concept of economic quantity relations and the concept of an economic good. Only experience can teach us whether or not these concepts are applicable to anything in the conditions under which our life must actually be lived. Only experience tells us that not all things in the external world are free goods. However, it is not experience, but reason, which is prior to experience, that tells us what is a free and what is an economic good. Some of the empirical conditions under which human action can take place are universally given. For example, all human actions occur during the passage of time, and all acting persons age in the course of time. Other empirical conditions, such as the use of money, Are of a more contingent nature. 
But however universal or contingent these conditions are, it remains true that once they are given, they cause certain objective effects, which are the subject matter of the a priori theory of human action. Because the theory of human action does not rely on data gathered through the senses, but rather on a priori facts that we come to know through discursive reasoning, it cannot possibly be verified or refuted by experience gained exclusively through observations. Mises highlighted the practical implications of this fundamental epistemological fact. Human action always confronts experience as a complex phenomenon that first must be analyzed and interpreted by a theory before it can even be set in the context of an hypothesis that could be proved or disproved. Hence the vexatious impasse created when supporters of conflicting doctrines point to the same historical data as evidence of their correctness. The statement that statistics can prove anything is a popular recognition of this truth. No political or economic program, no matter how absurd, can, in the eyes of its supporters, be contradicted by experience. Whoever is convinced a priori of the correctness of his doctrine can always point out that some condition essential for success according to his theory has not been met. Each of the German political parties seeks in the experience of the Second Reich confirmation of the soundness of its program. Supporters and opponents of socialism draw opposite conclusions from the experience of Russian Bolshevism. Disagreements concerning the probative power of concrete historical experience can be resolved only by reverting to the doctrines of the universally valid theory, which are independent of all experience. Every theoretical argument that is supposedly drawn from history necessarily becomes a logical argument about pure theory apart from all history. Twilight in Vienna The discussion of the epistemology of economics was continued in Mises' private seminar in Vienna, where his views found far more opposition and more competently offered than in Dresden. Several members of the seminar, including Felix Kaufmann and Robert Welder, were also members of a discussion group of the positivistic philosophers, the Vienna Circle. These men brought a completely different perspective to the problems, and the clash of their views with the opinion of the seminar director was a highlight in the history of those gatherings. Much of the fame that later accrued to the seminar through the recollections of its prominent participants was due to the methodological debates in the last years of its existence. Mises characterized them as vivid, even outright passionate. The brilliance of the discussions in the academic year 1933-1934 happily combined with the presence of a significant number of distinguished guests. Mises was at this point more than just a well-known author. He was a recognized leader among German-speaking economists. After his election to the board of the Verein für Sozialpolitik in early 1929, the private seminar attracted an increasing number of guests, especially from foreign countries. Alvin Hansen came in 1929, Frank Knight for a stint in May 1930, Carver, Batson and others in 1931, but the absolute high point was in 1933 to 1934 when four scholars from Japan, Ichitani, Midutani, Otaka, Takemura, Klaus Hugh Gateskull, Ragnar Norske, Karl Pribram, François Pirou, Gerhard Titner, and Emmanuel Winternitz, to name just the more prominent guests, attended the sessions. During his sojourn in Vienna, Hugh Gateskull set out to make a new translation of Ben Barbeck's Capital and Interest, which was still available only in a translation from the first edition. Mises later recalled that other English economists too were ready to shoulder the task, and even publication was not a problem in these days when the public interest in Austrian economics was at its peak in Great Britain. They abstained from this undertaking because they expected that Gateskull would execute his plan. But the young man in Mises's Vienna seminar never finished the job, Gateskull opted instead for an acceleration of his career in politics, becoming Minister of Fuel and Power in the post-war British Labour government. On March 9th, Mises gave the opening talk to a debate that would fill the next three months and which more narrowly concerned the question of whether economics was an a prioristic science of human action. Mises presented his case and also addressed the position of Kaufmann, who held that economic science was based on 
potentially fictional, stipulations arrived at through conventions. Mises' paper highlights the reason why his position was not very convincing to the other participants. More than in his previous written essays, he stressed that economic theory was an a priori discipline because it could not be verified or refuted in laboratory experiments. This line of argument was rather unsatisfactory because it seemed to draw epistemological conclusions from a mere technical difficulty. At any rate, it was unpersuasive to the next four presenters. Felix Kaufmann, Robert Welder, Erich Schiff, Oskar Morgenstern. In the wake of the economic crisis in 1931, the Christian socialists had proposed a coalition government to the socialists under Bauer. When Bauer refused, voters shifted increasingly to the Austrian National Socialists. Christian socialists now believed that the best way to hold back the tide of National Socialism was to use authoritarian methods to suppress opposition to the government. These tactics were decisively intensified after the National Socialists rose to power in Germany on January 30th, 1933. Many observers expected that Austria too would now fall into their hands, especially since they supported their Austrian branch organization through media campaigns and terror bombings against the Austrian government and its allies. Desperate in its quest to stop the Nazi tide, and keep Austria independent, the government under Engelbert Olfus concluded an alliance with fascist Italy, but also resorted to authoritarian methods in its domestic policies. The alliance with Italy was cemented in the Protocols of Rome, signed on March 17, 1934. Dolfus abolished the Parliamentary Republic, using a suitable opportunity on March 4, 1933, when all three presidents of the Parliament stepped down in protest against a questionable procedure. The last of the three officially convened the Parliament for March 15th, but now Dolfus stepped in, convinced the Christian Socialist Parliamentary faction to support his coup d'etat, and sent in the police to prevent a consolidation of the pro-German Social Democrats and German Nationalists on March 15th. In the course of the next few months, Dolfus also abolished the Communist Party and the Austrian branch of the German Nazi Party. Henceforth, he ruled dictatorially on the basis of an emergency law passed in 1917. On May 20th, he established the Vaterländische Front, Patriotic Front, to rally all forces loyal to the Austrian state. Dolfus proclaimed at a rally on September 11th, 1933, that his fatherland would now become the socialist, Christian, and German state Austria, based on its estates and with a strong authoritarian leadership. Mises became a member on March 1st, 1934, at the Patriotic Front's Kammer branch office. Membership was probably mandatory for all employees of public and semi-public organizations. Mises' membership card, number 282632, can now be found in the Grove City Archive. He was also a member of the Werk Neues Leben, a subdivision of the Patriotic Front. Ideologically, the Dolfus regime relied on state-of-the-art Catholic political and social theory, as embodied in the writings of Otmar Spann and Pope Pius XI, both of whom glorified social order based on the respect of the professional stände or estates. Arguably, his true significance lay elsewhere. Historian Ernst Hoare presents Dolfus as the first and only statesman of the First Austrian Republic who consciously and explicitly reclaimed an Austrian nation as distinct from the German nation and who framed his policies accordingly. While Spann's view had a deep impact on the German-speaking world, his influence could not match Pius XI encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, 1931, which was a shot in the arm for the corporatist movement. As one of Mises' correspondents from Switzerland reported, young Catholic politicians were entirely imbued with its ideas, even more than those of Ottmar Spann. Arguably, these young politicians gave the papal encyclical a stronger statist reading than was really warranted by its contents. Mises would later acknowledge that the man who wrote the first draft of the encyclical, Jesuit Pater O. von Nell Bräuning, was one of the few German economists who in the interwar period advocated economic freedom. 
In February 1934, the socialists rose one last time against the Dollfuss dictatorship when the police tried to seize a social democratic arms depot. In the provincial town of Linz, Dollfuss had their revolt bloodily repressed and lost no time using the opportunity to oust the social democrats from parliament. The leftover deputies then voted for a new constitution that in its essential lines returned to the pre-1907 constitutional model. Members of Parliament were no longer elected by universal suffrage, but appointed from among members of the major estates, such as landowners, clerics, labour unions, industrialists, etc. The new constitution was proclaimed on May 1st, 1934. On July 25th, 1934, Engelbert Dollfuss was murdered in the wake of an attempted nationalist socialist coup d'etat. German troops then marched on to the northern border of Austria and were called back only because Mussolini had concentrated his army on the southern border, pledging to guarantee the country's independence. From that day on, Austria's fate lay in the hands of the Italian government. Italy changed its alliances in the autumn of 1936 when France and Great Britain sanctioned the Italian invasion and annexation of Abyssinia. The new alliance between Hitler and Mussolini spelled the doom for Austrian independence. In the course of these events, life in Vienna became increasingly unpleasant for Mises. As in the First World War, there was once again an official government censor. For some years, Fritz Machlup had written weekly editorials, for the Neue Freie Presse. He stopped in May 1934 when it became pointless to write on the few topics still free from censorship. At that point, Machlup received a Rockefeller stipend to go to the United States, following in the footsteps of Wöglin and Habler. Now Mises himself would leave, to the great regret of his circle of friends and colleagues, who bid him farewell at the high point of their many years in his private seminar. Felix Kaufmann rhymed one last time. Farewell to Professor Mises. What is going to become of the Mises Kais in the year that's coming? Geneva can't for all suffice. My fingers won't stop drumming. The question will not leave me be. The seminar means everything to me. Thus Mises Kais lead. Liebe Kinder, weil heute Freitag ist, gibt es Mises Privat Seminar. Und dort gehe ich hin, auch wenn ein Maitag ist, süß und duftend wie keiner noch war. Denn der Blütenduft muss vergehen, doch die Wahrheit, die bleibt bestehen. Und die Wahrheit findest du im mieses Kreis, jeden Abend Zehnter und Scheffelweis. Fängt man richtig zu streiten erst an, denn die Button, die haben dort Anschan. Ich gehe heute Abend zum Mieses hin, weil ich so gern dort bin. Man spricht ja nirgends so schon in Wien über Wirtschaft, Gesellschaft und Sinn. Und willst du recht das Verstehen verstehen, musst a tout prix du zu Mises auch gehen, weil man das nirgends sonst deutlich weiß als nur im Mieseskreis. Ist auch ein Problem noch so konsistent, traut sich gar nicht zu Tiere herein, denn es weiß sehr wohl, dass Gefahr es rennt, aufgelost binnen kurzem zu sein. Sind auch noch so hart manche Nisse, knackt man doch sie durch kluge Schlisse, bis die Kerne uns auf der Zunge zergehen, wie sonst nur noch die Sissen Palinen, deren glittiger Geist offeriert, dass das Schweigen nicht gar zu schwer wird. Refrain Ist der Geist und Zenur mit Weisheit voll, flieht ihr Magen sich traurig und leer, doch erhalt er bald seinen Einfuhrzoll, denn wir gehen in den grünen Anker. Dort ist die Fröhlichkeit unser Motto, bei Spaghetti und bei Risotto, wie die Zeit vergeht, keiner hat's gedacht, denn auf einmal schlagt es schon mit der Nacht, doch jetzt kommt die genialste Idee, man geht noch in das Kunstlercafé. Refrain. Manchmal denkt man sich, hat denn einen Sinn, diese ganze Problemspalterei. Draußen fließt derweil froh das Leben hin und selbst ist man so wenig dabei. War's nicht klüger, im Strom zu schwimmen, als die Wasserkraft zu bestimmen? Ließ man nicht besser alles Denken sein, lebte einfach froh in den Tag hinein und genosse des Augenblicks Rausch. Doch man weiß ja, hier gibt's keinen Tausch. Refrain The Song of the Mises Circle Come and gather all around, it's Friday. Time for Mises' Privatseminar. 
I'll be there for sure, even if it's May, and the day is the sweetest thus far. Oh, the fragrance fades, it is certain, but truth you'll find knows no curtain. In the Mises Kais, it's always center stage. Buckets full of truth remain the latest rage. And when you begin to debate, you know that the hour will grow late. You'll find me with Mises tonight, tonight. No longer do I need to roam. Society, economy, and truth, that's right, are debated, defended. I'm home. And if you desire for stains made clear, at all cost you must come, get yourself here, for clarity, wisdom, and truth entice, here at the Mises Kais. Do you know a problem full of nasty quirks? Come escorted to Mises' door. It will know full well this time that danger lurks, as it's whittled right down to its core. Many shells, of course, know the same fate, nuts so hard to crack, but at this rate they will melt on tongues that know deductive prose, like the chocolate creams our friend so kindly chose, making silence a happy refrain. But now let us all sing again. Refrain. Ten o'clock comes round, and wisdom's filled our minds, but our bodies demand ever more. That green anchor calls, and here our stomachs find import tariffs to even the score. Here's where ear is our motto. Have spaghetti and eat risotto. No one ever dreams how fast the time can race. Midnight rings. We take our favorite place in that nice little Kunstler Café. An ingenious end to the day. Refrain. All the time it comes when we must question why. Is such questioning really that smart? Life goes on and on, it just keeps flowing by. And we all play a very small part. We could swim along, take no notice of the tide's direction, the world's focus. Should we not keep these thoughts at bay? Push our cares aside and relish what's today. And yet there's no trade-off at hand. Somehow we must take a stand.